This is PsychBoost helping you build psychology publication one video at a time. This video is on development and in this ninth GCSE video we'll be covering the effects of learning on development. The very kind support of students and teachers who donate on Patreon help me help you by continuing to make these videos and resources. A very big thank you for your help guys. To join them, follow this link. For everyone else, you might want to check out the free worksheet for this video and the quiz. I imagine that you're here to study GCSE psychology, so here are the terms on the AQA GCSE specification we're going to cover in this video. As we go through the video, they'll be in red text, and you need to be able to respond to questions on all of this. We're going to start with a topic that you're probably familiar with due to its use in schools in the last few years, and that's Dweck's Mindset Theory. This theory is about motivation. It tries to explain by how changing motivation students can be more academically successful. To do that, it classifies students as either having a growth or a fixed mindset. Fixed mindset students see ability as something outside of their control. They think it's set at birth, so genetic, and if they face a task that's difficult for them, they assume they're not able to overcome the challenge, so they give up. Growth mindset students see ability as something that is in their control. They can improve by learning and practice. If they face a challenge, they're going to be less likely to give up, assuming that they're going to be successful if they keep working hard enough. Now, the theory suggests that people are not just completely one or the other. They are somewhere in between, with only a few people at the extreme ends. Also, if you have a growth or fixed mindset, it can depend on the context. Now, the role of praise is thought to be important in developing a growth mindset. If parents and teachers only ever praise success, that can be problematic. If people are only praise for success, people who are not praised may think that successful people are just naturally better and they can't compete. But if praise is given for effort, it's possible for everyone to increase their effort. So that increased effort leads to increased success. Another aspect of praise, according to Dweck, is that praise should be seen as meaningful. So not just giving out all the time for low effort to make people feel better. The term self-efficacy means a person's self-belief that they can actually succeed at a task. Self-efficacy of a student can be developed by teachers by creating classroom experiences in which students achieve success with their tasks. So you design tasks that are challenging but possible for that particular student or group of students to complete. That way they get used to succeeding and expecting to succeed. There is experimental evidence that supports Dweck's mindset theory. In one of Dweck's own studies, she showed that 10 to 12 year old students who were praised for effort rather than intelligence on a task, then went on to be more persistent and show more enjoyment on a follow-up task. Dweck's theory also clearly has practical applications. It provides guidance to teachers on how to help their students achieve academically. For example, using process-oriented praise when giving feedback on work. But there are criticisms of Dweck's work. By focusing on the students having the correct mindset for success, people in charge of education can ignore reasons outside of the control of students for underperformance. There are cultural reasons for poor performance, under-resourced schools and poor teaching. Dweck's theory potentially blames underprivileged children for their own underperformance. And research that looks at the application of Dweck's research in schools has shown very limited improvement in school performance. This could be a problem with the theory, or it could be a problem in implementing it properly in schools. Now, before Dweck's mindset theory became popular, the hot idea in schools was learning styles. Now, the idea behind learning styles was people are individuals, and they vary in the way they take in and process information. So it was suggested that teachers should try and match each student's learning style with an appropriate classroom activity. There are a few variations of learning styles, but the one we'll talk about had verbalizers and visualizers. So, if you're classified as a verbalizer, you were thought to process information better audibly, so in the form of words. The words could be written out or they could be spoken by the teacher. And it was thought that verbalizers had difficulty processing visual information. On the other hand, if you're classified as a visualizer, you're thought to process information better visually so in the form of images, pictures, diagrams, and graphs. And for revision would do tasks like making mind maps. 
and it was suggested by learning theory that visualizers would find it more difficult to process information in the form of words. I'm going to give a positive evaluation here because what follows will be a very long criticism that we can use if we're going to negatively evaluate learning styles. So the positive learning styles is it was seen as modernizing teaching, moving away from a one size fits all rote learning approach. It made teachers focus more on the individual needs of the students and use more varied teaching styles in the classroom. But a researcher called Willingham is very critical of learning styles. Willingham thought that learning styles don't improve children's learning and trying to match a task to a child's preferred learning style was just counterproductive. If a child struggles either visually or verbally, they should be given more opportunities to practice that skill of using more of that type of information, not less. So Willingham's learning theory states that the most appropriate task for teaching children should be the one that matches the content, not the child's learning style. If teaching maps and geography or art or graphs and maths, use visual tasks. If teaching essay structure or language, use words. By giving children a range of tasks, they'll improve with visual and verbal skills that they will be required to use in the future, like at work. Willingham did think that education should be informed by psychology, but by more scientific, cognitive and neuroscience studies on learning. Willingham also suggests that the main focus to judge effective learning wasn't the style used at all, but if the students actually remembered the information. There's a large amount of evidence to support Willingham's argument that learning styles is not effective, and there are very few studies that actually support learning styles. Willingham's ideas have been influential for teaching. He has ideas for improving teaching and his effective countering of learning theories has saved teachers time from having to convert classes into multiple different learning styles. But some people criticise Willingham as rejecting modern forms of teaching and focusing too much on uncreative traditional rote learning. Now we've covered the content, you need to be able to use all that information to actually answer questions. Here are five questions I've made to test your skills. So, pause the video and give them a go. For those of you who support me on Patreon, i put together an additional video showing you how to answer these properly. For everyone else, thanks for watching, like, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next video on social influence conformity.